Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here. This event is a special pleasure to me. I'm Joshua Tucker. I'm a professor in the politics department, part of the comparative politics faculty um, at NYU, but also the director of the Jordan Center uh, uh, for the Advanced Study of Russia here at NYU. And this is our first, uh, we've been co-sponsoring events together, co-sponsoring speakers with the Jordan Center and uh, the Comparative Politics Workshop for a number of years now, but we had been doing this in person um, and the talks were held in the in the politics department. So we, we would get a few people from the Jordan Center coming over. But as we have a, a large, now that this is the first time we've done it virtually, and as we have a large, much larger crowd from the Jordan Center this time, I just wanted to inform all of our sort of normal Jordan Center viewers uh, that this is this is part of a this is joint with the politics department and it's part of a, an ongoing weekly comparative politics workshop. So if you like what you see here, um, but in the politics department, it is very much our tradition to interrupt uh, speakers while they're talking, not interrupt them mid sentence, but to ask questions during the talk. So for some of you at the Jordan Center, I know this is not the norm that we normally have at Jordan Center talk. So I just wanted to give you a heads up, no one is being rude. And Katya is actually an economist. And so if we didn't interrupt her during the talk, she would think we were being rude. Um, so anyway, so I just wanted to give a quick, uh, quick uh, thanks to everybody um, and welcome everybody here on behalf of the Jordan Center. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Tara Slow, my colleague in the politics department, who's been running the comparative politics workshop to take you through the logistics and who's going to introduce our speaker today. But I, I'm going to let Katya give, uh, Tara give the official introduction. But I just want to say how much of a pleasure it is for me to have my old friend Katya here uh, with us today. So I'm very much looking forward to the talk and glad so many of you can join us. Great, thanks so much, Josh. We are really thrilled to welcome Katya Jaroskaya from Paris School of Economics to talk about diffusion of gender norms. Um, so the way that we will do the, uh, the questions throughout the talk and after is if you use the raise hand icon in Zoom. Um, if you have any issues or have trouble finding it, you can feel free to chat in the box. And if there's sort of anything that you don't want to interrupt for, you can write it into the chat. Um, we will moderate as necessary, but uh, we're really looking forward to the talk. Thanks. All right. It's up to me right now. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like to first start with uh, uh, saying that this is joint work with uh, uh, two of my students, one former student and the other is current student who will be in the market probably in uh, two or three uh, years. So look uh, up for her if you're interested in this kind of subject. So Josh correctly said that I'm an economist, but I'm an economist who works on subjects which are usually of joint interest between comparative politics and economics. So hopefully this is one of them. And the paper title is Diffusion of Gender Norms, Evidence from Stalin's Ethnic Deportations. So I will start with the uh, observation that uh, a consensus has emerged in essentially all social sciences over the last 20 years or so that culture is an important driver of uh, human behavior and it is distinct from environment, institutions or genes. And from the important work of Vicin and Berger, we know that it's transferred both vertically across generations, but also horizontally across sometimes people, but sometimes even groups like uh, ethnic groups in particular. And uh, if I look at uh, political economy literature, and I know economic side of this literature better than polit political side, but still, you know, overall, it seems that there's a lot of evidence of cultural pers persistence and cultural barriers to social learning. And all of them basically point to the importance of vertical transmission of culture. At the same time, uh, there's a vast anthropological evidence that there is also a horizontal transmission of cultural traits. Yet in uh, political economy research, uh, there is uh, not so much on the horizontal transmission between group uh, transmission of culture. And uh, those papers which exist, they actually uh, so far have yielded mixed results about uh, whether the exposure to a group with different, different uh, cultural norms leads to cultural diffusion. And let me give you a couple of examples. So on the one hand, uh, there are works which show that when exposed, people may embrace new alien cultures. And there are two very nice uh, works on this. Cliff Klingsmith and uh, with co-authors showed, for example, that uh, people completely change their view of the world and attitudes after uh, Hajj uh, 
depending on uh, who they were exposed to du during the Hajj, the, during this religious experience. And uh, Tucho and Bapa, for example, they show that uh, the uh, work migrants from Jordan to uh, Saudi Arabia, when they return to Jordan, they actually uh, become much more conservative in their views um, overall, and particularly on gender norms. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, there is quite a lot of evidence also that, well, some evidence, I wouldn't say a lot, but uh, some evidence, interesting evidence that people, people sometimes reject alien cultures and increase identification with their own. In particular, my own paper with uh, uh, Irena Grossfeld shows uh, that uh, this was the case uh, during the coexistence of Jews and non-Jews or Gentiles in, the, in Eastern Europe. The same or similar story could be told about Greeks and Armenians uh, and Turks coexisting uh, before the Armenian genocide in the Ottoman Empire. But overall, if we think about well-identified studies of uh, interactions between different groups, they usually need to get some kind of experimental setting or rely on some kind of experimental, quasi-experimental setting in order to ensure exogenous sources of variation and exposure, and which are important in order to identify the causal effect. However, uh, usually uh, there is the problem with such experiments. Let me tell you, in order to, uh, in studying cultural diffusion, and let me explain what I mean by this. Usually in such experiments, uh, people of different cultural backgrounds are assigned to uh, the same locations randomly. Think about uh, the work which has been studying random locations of children to classes, uh, students to dorms, or soldiers to regiments, or uh, refugees to different uh, uh, social housing, things like this. Uh, and in such experiments, very often the representatives of different groups are uh, actually incentivized directly to cooperate. Think about uh, uh, students and soldiers who are given common tasks. So they do need to cooperate in order to succeed. At the same time, when we think about the uh, uh, study which I uh, just uh, referred to about the uh, common Hajj experience, it, it could also be the case that in the studies that you, people are united by a common goal, even though if it's not imposed on them. Yet, in many real settings, uh, people choose freely uh, whether to interact with members of the other group, and groups often have conflicting economic or political objectives. And therefore, even if groups coexist in close proximity, people may self-segregate and avoid contact with representatives of the other groups, which probably would mean that we wouldn't expect to see uh, cultural diffusion. And uh, uh, given that this is the state of the literature, that's where we come in, because we think that to study properly cultural diffusion, one needs to combine two features. On the one hand, one still needs to have an experimental setting of cultural exposure in order to identify things properly. But at the same time, it would be nice to have no control over the interactions between individuals. Basically, you want to uh, let people choose whether they are uh, going to interact with each other or not. And uh, that's, we think, is uh, why we want to study the Stalin's ethnic deportations of, or during the Second World War. Because actually, they give us a historical setting which combines both of these features. And just to uh, tell you what we are doing, we use this historical experiment to study how gender norms, which is a cultural trait uh, which uh, was uh, very different across different deported groups, diffused from the departees to the local uh, native population at the departation locations. So uh, let me just give you a few uh, slides of uh, what these uh, Stalin's ethnic departations were like. Uh, uh, I know that in this particular audience, maybe I don't need to uh, give you many details because you're very knowledgeable of the Soviet context, but still it would be good to fix uh, the facts. Well, first of all, it's worth noting that over 2 million people were deported from the Western parts of the USSR to Siberia and Central Asia during the Second World War. And uh, the only reason for their deportation was that they belonged to an ethnicity representatives of which were 
uh, suspected, let's say, quote unquote, by uh, Soviet authorities of potential or actual collaboration with the Nazis against the Soviets. And uh, I will particularly focus on four groups of ethnic departees, which were the largest groups. They constituted 84% of all ethnic departees during this period. So the first and the biggest group are Germans, the Soviet Germans. The over 1 million of them were deported, so they constituted over half of all ethnic departees. The, the second largest group of ethnic departees were Chechens, so it was a little bit less than a quarter of a million of them were deported. Uh, the third largest group was Crimean Tatars, 185 thousand of them were deported. And the, the fourth largest group were uh, Miskatian Turks. So 75,000 of them were deported. Importantly, these four deportations were indiscriminate. So all people which belong to these ethnicities, men, women, children, irrespective of where they lived, were deported in order to bring them away from the, from the front. And uh, just to give a visual of how it was happening. So these, uh, this is a picture of uh, Chechen departees on the road to their destination. You see that there's a soldier overseeing uh, the movement of people. So these people were brought uh, by uh, usually either on horse drawn carts or on tracks to the railroad, put in this kind of uh, uh, trains and brought to the remote locations in Siberia and Central Asia. And I'll show you uh, where they were put um, in a little while. So, and here is the picture of uh, uh, Germans, Soviet Germans at, at work in Siberia at the, the deportation location. You see that these ladies are doing heavy manual labor, which is important part of our story. And uh, let me, um, now just basically describe a little bit the conditions of uh, uh, these ethnic deportations. So these were very, very different uh, uh, than, let's say, have, being a gulag prisoner. Particularly, the deportees were not confined to camps. They were not guarded. Uh, they were free to interact within local population. Of course, they were not free people because they weren't able to uh, move uh, from the locality to which they were assigned. Yet the departees and natives lived and worked in close proximity. Actually, when the, the number of departees arriving to a particular locality was not too big relative to uh, the local population, they were actually advised to find accommodation among the locals. They were given work together with the locals and their children went to the same schools as locals. Uh, and uh, it's worth noting that uh, departees actually had to present themselves to the um, uh, local police chief, let's say, to uh, prove their uh, physical presence at the uh, departation destination regularly. First, as often as once a week, then, then once a month, and then, you know, this period was, uh, uh, as, as time went by, became longer and longer, but uh, still they had to uh, be physically there. And uh, another important restriction on what uh, departees were doing is that uh, they were not allowed in any of the white collar jobs and uh, had to do uh, manual labor irrespective of their skills, which actually was binding mostly for Soviet Germans, which was uh, the most uh, educated uh, group among all. And uh, with that, let me just uh, uh, mention uh, a little bit, I'll talk about that uh, uh, more uh, during the talk, but I would like to say that uh, the departee groups uh, differed along many dimensions. First of all, they were obviously uh, representative of different ethnicities. They had different religion. Uh, uh, Soviet Germans were mostly, their traditional religion mostly was Protestant, although there was a short, uh, very small uh, uh, part of them were Catholic, uh, uh, whereas uh, all the other three big groups of the parties were, were, had traditional religion of Islam. Uh, the education levels, levels were very different, but also what was different was gender norms, and that's the focus of our study. In particular, uh, from the work of Soviet anthropologists, we know that Soviet Germans were 
essentially the most equal, gender equal compared to any other group residing in the Soviet Union, essentially. Uh, and generally, you know, if you look at all Protestant departees compared to all Muslim departees, the Protestant departees were a lot more gender equal than, than, than Muslim departees. Uh, with this, uh, let, that brings me to the research question which we're uh, studying. We ask uh, whether the group composition of uh, uh, departees affect gender norms among the native local population at the destinations of uh, ethnic deportations. And here it's important right away to say that uh, the way the deportation locations were determined actually suggests a way to identify it. Essentially, it was uh, quasi-random within uh, subnational regions. And just to preview the results, uh, uh, we find that uh, there's a strong resemblance between the gender norms among the local population today at the uh, destinations of ethnic departations and those of uh, former departees. Uh, on top of that, vast majority of departees uh, and their descendants left when they were allowed to, and I'll tell you when that was uh, for different groups at, at, at a different period of time, uh, at a different point on time, and also, we only look at the uh, gender norms today for uh, representatives of traditional ethnic groups, which are majority, local majorities in the destinations of uh, deportations. So Russians in, Ru in Siberia and uh, uh, Central Asians, let's say the title ethnicity of each Central Asian Republic in each Central Asian Republic, for example, Kazakhs in Kazakhstan, Uzbeks in Uzbekistan. Therefore, our outcome, uh, so our result basically is an evidence of uh, horizontal between ethnic group cultural transmission. Of course, there is also, in addition, some vertical transmission from, from parents to, to kids, but that we focus on it less because we feel that this is a much more well-established fact in, in the literature. And uh, uh, I guess here, let me just pause for a second and see if there are any questions about the setup. Actually, I have a question. Could you, could you say a little bit more about why you think this is quasi-random assignment? I mean, I know we have historians on the line here as well, but like, it just seems that by definition, one would think of ethnic cleansing, which is this kind of analogous to what's going on here, as being not random assignment. The whole point is that you want to get a population away from other people. And so I would just be interested in hearing more about like what the process by which this is being randomly assigned because obviously they're not allowed to be where they were. So they're not totally being randomly assigned across the Russian empire. There had to be some constrictions on it. So is the assumption that if the area where they went was not random, but which ethnic group went to it is random or is it vice versa or I just- Yeah, I will, I will, I will spend the, quite a long time on this because it's a key thing for their identification. So if, if I may ask you to wait for a little bit with this, that would be great. Or we, I, we can jump there, but I'm coming to this and that's, uh, that's very important. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this discussion. Right, thanks a lot for this question because that is really the key to, uh, you know, me selling you this paper. Without uh, these uh, uh, quasi-random exposure, I cannot ar argue that uh, uh, I, I can actually identify anything. So bear with me for this and I'm coming to this, but let me first just preview uh, the results with a very, very simple illustration from the, uh, from the data. This is just a summary of the data. It's important uh, to note right away is that in order to have uh, the quasi-random exposure, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, we need to look at within subnational region variation. So the uh, share of departees of different kinds between the, uh, varies between different regions, definitely not randomly. So, but within the, each region, we argue that there is a random exposure. And here we basically summarize the two of our main explanatory variables. One is just a uh, composite measure of progressive gender attitudes. I'll tell you what they, they are. Uh, these are self-reported and also the female entrepreneurship. And we look at the uh, level of, the, of both of these outcomes for in the locality compared to its uh, regional level. And we 
uh, sort the all the localities with the which were destinations of uh, uh, ethnic deportations into three groups by tercile of the share of Protestants, you can say the share of Soviet Germans, it's almost the same thing, uh, among all local ethnic departees. And what we see is that in uh, those localities where uh, there were uh, many Soviet Germans among the ethnic departees, the uh, gender attitudes and female entrepreneurship is significantly higher than the regional average. Whereas in uh, those localities where departees were predominantly Muslims, the uh, gender attitudes and female entrepreneurship among local population uh, is below uh, the regional average. And here the region is uh, a subnational region within the Soviet Republic, which is oblast essentially. Sorry for, the, for using Russian, but I know that many of you uh, speak Russian. Yeah, so with this, uh, uh, we contribute to several literatures and let me just uh, move ahead uh, uh, and uh, uh, rather talk about our result. And if there are questions on the literature, I'll come back to this. So uh, it's worth uh, noting what the timeline of these deportations were. So first, uh, there was, uh, so uh, what, the first wave happened um, which we are focusing on. Actually, there were some deportations starting in 39, uh, for example, from Poland, but we're not focusing on them because they were not indiscriminate. We are looking only at indiscriminate deportations. And the first one happened uh, right after the Soviets and Nazis from allies became enemies. And that's when uh, the Soviet authorities decided that ethnic Germans who were residing uh, in the Soviet Union potentially uh, became um, a threat to them because they could, they, they, uh, the Soviet authorities decided that it's likely that they will cover, collaborate with the Nazis. So that wave was called preventive. And then uh, that's, that's when Soviet Germans were deported. The next wave uh, uh, included the three other big groups of departees, uh, Chechens, Crimean Tatars, and Miskechen Turks. That was called retributive, quote unquote, because actually they happened in 33 and 34 already after some, some examples of uh, uh, representatives of these groups uh, uh, collaborating with the Nazis. However, it's worth noting that, of course, these are abs were absolutely, uh, let's say, um, uh, random, the peak of these groups, because you can find examples of collaboration with the Nazis among any group residing in the Soviet Union, obviously. So, so there were other reasons. So they weren't really in any way retributive. That's, that's just the Soviet propaganda, if you like. And uh, as far as how much time the departees uh, stayed in their locations, it's worth noting that uh, Chechens were quote unquote pardoned during this crucial thaw. So they were allowed to come back to their homelands uh, by the end of the 50s. Whereas Soviet Germans, Crimean Tatars, and Mercedian Turks were never pardoned. So the restrictions on uh, the location uh, uh, on which they can reside in their departmental destinations was slowly lifting. However, they were never returned to their homelands. So they essentially stayed until uh, in the destination uh, departations until the country which uh, sent them to these locations um, uh, disappeared fell apart. So now we're coming finally to the discussion of uh, Josh's uh, uh, question. So here uh, I just plot all the um, uh, destinations of these ethnic deportations. However, this map would be a little bit misleading because it doesn't tell you how many people went to which of these locations. And this, in this graph we show with this uh, temperature plot the density of ethnic deportees in a place and we see that vast majority of ethnic departees were sent to Eastern Siberia and Central Asia. So this, this place. And of course, the first thing to note is that of course the destinations uh, were not random in any way of ethnic departees as a, 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 as a group. And here we can see, for example, that they were much more likely to be along the railroad, which is reasonable because uh, they were brought by the rail uh, to uh, these remote locations. And here I just uh, zoom in into this place where most of the departees ended up. 
Of course, that's that's not the only uh, uh, the only correlate of uh, departation destinations. So, first of all, uh, let me describe how these uh, departation destinations were determined. Uh, the uh, the central authorities in Moscow they determined the quotas of uh, departees of each kind to go to each of the of the subnational regions. And again, let me say that subnational regions are oblasts. So these are pretty pretty small units, actually, not 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 very large ones. And of course, uh, it is important, first of all, to note that uh, there were two um, aims uh, which Soviet authorities had in in this ethnic departations. First, they wanted to move these people away from the front. So quasi security reasons, if you want, but the, the second and also very important objective was that they wanted to use this labor uh, in places where there was uh, excess demand for manual labor. And when they designed this grand plan, the distribution between regions, of course, it could be that, that they have taken into consideration the culture of the parties and culture of the local population. And what we see actually that, you know, there are many more Germans who went to, let's say, Siberia than to the Central Asia, and there are more Muslim departees who went to the Central Asia rather than to Siberia. But overall, there is a mixture of the two. However, in contrast, uh, uh, what ha what's happening within the assigned regions is a completely different uh, story because the final departee destination within the, uh, uh, the region uh, were determined solely by the local needs of manual labor and was determined already on the place. So the departees arrived to the main train station of the regional capital. That's where they were brought by the, let's say, central planner, quote unquote. And then there was something which essentially resembled a, if you like, a slave market, uh, because uh, the departees were desperate to find accommodation and jobs. And uh, uh, the administration of local state firms, be that coal horse, soft horse, or construction firms, or what have you, came and uh, those who had blue collar vacancies with the hardest work which they couldn't fill in by the local population, they, they took uh, the departees. Importantly, uh, the local population was ho fairly homogeneous within the regions. It's not always the case. There are some diverse regions, but those regions where the departees uh, ended up were fairly homogeneous, which means that uh, natives in different localities within the regions have similar preferences with regard to accepting different kinds of departees. So they were only looking for manual labor. And as a result, we argue, and that's here is our assumption that the choice of destination localities within the region were orthogonal to the skills, ethnic identity, and the culture of departees. However, we are not just uh, simply uh, stating this as an assumption. We try to test it uh, to the extent the, we can test it uh, with regard to observables. And we have a long list of characteristics of these places. And I'm going to show you three tables like this, which show the balance. Uh, so to what extent uh, the uh, dis destinations of the departees and the group composition of the departees at the destination locations provided that a locality was a destination, uh, de uh, destination of a deportation, are correlated with all sorts of historical geographical characteristics. In particular, in this table, what, I, what, what we show, and I'm gonna show you exactly the same uh, other tables about other characteristics, there are uh, three sets of regressions. The first set uh, of regressions shows that uh, whether a locality is a deportation destination is correlated with pretty much everything. And you're gonna see that. And that's not surprising because the, the, remember the second goal of these departations was to fill in the vacancies for hard labor. So, so of course the demand for hard labor is correlated with all sorts of stuff. And that's what we see exactly. However, uh, provided that the place was a, a destination of ethnic departations, the ethnic, the group composition of the departees, 
is completely not, as you can see, correlated with the, with the, uh, with the characteristics which we look at. In particular, uh, the, the second set of regressions looks at all deportation locations, and the third set of regressions looks at those deportation locations for which we have outcome data. So basically, this is the balance which is uh, reported for the localities which we actually use in our, in our study. So that was about uh, uh, geographical characteristics and distance to Gulag and th things like this and distance to the uh, uh, evacuated enterprises, for example. Here is another set of balancing tests. Again, uh, here we see the same structure. Uh, so what we're interested in is balance here. So this is uh, the structure of the local population as measured by the pre-war uh, population census. Uh, we see pretty good balance both on the size of the local population, in other words, urbanization, and uh, on, the, on the composition. And we also could look at the uh, pre-Soviet uh, census, so the last and the only actually Russian Empire census, the uh, 1897 census, which actually has a lot more characteristics because it also gives you some information about the industrial structure of the localities. And we again see that uh, there is some important uh, correlates of the, whether the uh, location subsequently became the deportation destination, but essentially no co covariates as far as the composition, group composition of deportees is concerned. So I hope that it, it uh, uh, answers the, uh, the Josh's question of why we, we have this random exposure. And could fact, I, could, could... Yeah. Could I ask a question on this? Uh, sorry. So, uh, so first, just a, a quick clarification. So, when you say localities, what do you mean? Is it municipality? Is it town? Uh, and the second one. So, how? What do we make of the fact that in the first table we do see that Germans were settled further away from urban centers? Right. There is this big significant effect of positive distance to the local capital. So, how should we think? about the balance, lack of balance on that particular dimension. Mm -hmm. So you, you are uh, talking about this, this particular characteristic, right? Yeah, so, so uh, what, what I mean by uh, locality is uh, Soviet municipalities, essentially, because that's, that's the level at which I have uh, 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 characteristics from the census. So these are rayons, in other words, in, 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 in Russian. Although we do have some data on the actual places, we definitely have very good data on the actual places for the deportation destinations. But some of these characteristics we can only match uh, with uh, the census at the rayon level. So this is a very, very good point that actually there are some occasional misbalances. It's important to note that, and I'm gonna show you this when I show the results, that none of our results depend on uh, the set of covariates. So we can take any of these covariates and all of them together and control for them and our results will be completely unaffected. On top of that, if you, if you see here, particularly about the variable which you're asking about, which is the right thing to, to look at, is uh, the distance to capital city. On the sample for which we uh, have outcome variables, uh, the uh, relationship is actually negative and insignificant. So overall, uh, you know, of course, when we look at uh, 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 almost a hundred variables, we will have some misbalances just by chance. But we, we certainly what we see is that none of them actually are consistent, if you like, between different samples. On top of that, I'm gonna show you that if we control for, for this variation, that does not affect our results whatsoever. Katya, can I just clarify, the share of Protestant deportees is the share of all deportees that is Protestant or the share of Protestant deportees as the share of the local population? Yeah, so I should have been more clear uh, about this. This is the share of Protestant departees among all ethnic departees. So among the uh, G Germans, uh, uh, Chechens, uh, Crimean Tatars, and Muscatian Turks. So we're talking about group composition of the departees. I'm going to show you the results by the uh, uh, relative size of the deportation to the local population. 
Thanks. But overall, what we're interested in is, is what kind of departees the local population is exposed to conditional on the size and presence of this departation. Thanks. But that's an excellent question too. Right, so let me summarize a little bit uh, the um, abandoned uh, anecdotal evidence on, or from Soviet historians and Soviet anthropologists. So everybody essentially agree that gender norms were substantially more progressive among uh, Soviet Germans than among anybody, uh, any other group in the Soviet Union. And in fact, Soviet, uh, not so, um, excuse me, uh, the German girls were routinely educated as early as uh, mid 19th century, which was not the case for any other group. Only, only gentry educated their kids at that time in, in, in uh, the Russian empire. And uh, um, it's important maybe also to uh, say that uh, uh, how Germans ended up to be in the Soviet Union and before in the Russian empire, that was on, on the invitation of Catherine the Great they came and she gave them land uh, in, in, uh, in the Volga region. And uh, then um, uh, also in addition to land, they were given uh, religious freedom, which was uh, rare in the Russian empire and a lot of autonomy. And uh, um, so they were actually doing pretty well. Uh, in this uh, Volga region. And then when, after the revolution, actually Soviets uh, kept this autonomy. And uh, at some point there was uh, an institution of uh, Soviet German uh, Socialist Republic uh, in, in, in Volga, uh, along the Volga uh, river. And uh, um, overall, uh, they were very well assimilated group, uh, ethnic group within, uh, within the Soviet Union. Um, uh, which uh, didn't really see any trouble coming before uh, the Second World War. And uh, at the same time, uh, it's probably worth noting that there is a big uh, discussion and disagreement between different historians and Soviet uh, anthropologists about uh, whether uh, Chechens were particularly uh, unequal in terms of their, their gender attitudes compared to all other Muslim departee groups or generally also Muslim population, for example, in Central Asia. And there are some uh, uh, Soviet historians who claim that Chechens were the worst, but at the same time, there's, there are others who claim that this is not quite true and it may be part of the Soviet propaganda. So, so overall, as far as the uh, relative uh, level of gender norms of the native population in Central Asia and uh, the compared to the Muslim departees, it's hard to say you know, who was more, uh, who was less equal, but overall uh, it is clear that uh, Germans were much more progressive than any of these groups. And it's worth also noting that on top of that, equality of men and women was part of Soviet ideology. So the Soviets are trying to impose equality on these uh, fairly, let's say, backward groups to start with just to illustrate these claims with some data which we could uh, get on this, we use this Russian Empire census. So it's even pre-revolution for, and we summarize the education levels and the labor force participation by gender uh, for these groups I'm talking about. So for the local populations, these are Central Asians and Russians here for urban areas, rural areas, and the same thing for the, for the um, labor force participation. And these are the uh, groups which subsequently were deported. So Germans, Chechens, Crimean Tatars, and Miskatian Turks. For example, if we look at this figure, and I hope you see this little hand, which I, I'm uh, uh, showing you, we see that back even in 1897, men and women among uh, Germans were very, very closely educated to each other for in, the, in the urban areas and even in the rural areas. So then the next uh, uh, most equal group was, was Russians, which were the uh, local natives in the Siberian destination locations. At the same time, uh, the rest are first much less educated, but also much more 
uh, unequal. And the same thing you could see, for example, here, because there is some variation in labor force participation in urban areas. In, in rural areas, there is very little. But even here, you could see that uh, German inequality between men and women in labor force participation for Germans and Russians is smaller than for the, for the other groups. All right. So let me maybe pause again and see if there are any questions before I come to the data sources, because all of this was background. Katya, I have one, this is Tim, one technical question. The primary sampling units that fall into your analysis, how did, are they systematically different from uh, uh, the, the, the sample itself? Should we be concerned at all? So this is this is an excellent uh, question about those. Uh, yeah. So this is an excellent question. The primary that that actually relates to the data sources which uh, uh, we use. So so uh, let me uh, say right away where the contemporary data come from. So we look at the life and transition survey, which uh, had several waves, but the wave of 2016 is the only wave which asks question about gender attitudes. So that's the one which we use. And it covers uh, uh, five uh, uh, countries uh, in uh, um, which, which uh, were the destinations of ethnic departations. So overall, the departations were uh, done on, in all countries of the, um, of the Central Asia and in Russia, but, but uh, there is no data on Turkmenistan. So, but however, there were very few ethnic departations in Turkmenistan. So overall, we cover uh, the area of ethnic departations. However, within the countries, of course, the uh, primary sampling units uh, are not necessarily covering all the uh, um, destination locations. So here, uh, I should say that uh, given that uh, the primary sampling units in life and transition survey are picked in order to uh, have a representative sample by, by country, uh, we have a pretty good uh, sample for the Central Asia. For Russia, it's less so because there are not that many uh, primary sampling, sampling units in the area which we, which we care about, which is Eastern Siberia. Still, there is, there is uh, enough data to, to estimate some stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's a good question whether there is a, uh, some kind of special selection. Uh, I would guess that uh, that precisely because uh, the life and transition survey was supposed to be representative that uh, probably tells us that we at least can get a snapshot of those uh, local populations which happen to be destinations of deportation locations which are representative for these countries. That doesn't mean, of course, that we have the representative sample of all uh, deportation destinations. And uh, uh, there, I can't really say much more about this for now. Uh, we did not do try to see whether there is any systematic difference between those deportation destinations which happen to be uh, covered by Life and Transition Survey uh, compared to those which don't, and I think that's a good idea. We should do that. I will. I will think about that. But so far, I have no uh, direct answer to that question. If that's what what you'd like to really see, uh, so I hope it at least partially uh, answers your question, Tim. So now let me uh, say where do we get the data on ethnic departation. So that's the most detailed part of our study because that comes from uh, uh, National Archives, from GARP. And uh, uh, the source of the data is actually the registries of the uh, ethnic departees at, uh, when, when they were done at the time when they were supposed to uh, present themselves to the local authorities. So NKVD actually made two censuses of all ethnic uh, departees and non-ethnic departees at the um, destination locations. And we collected data on uh, the census which were, took place in 51. 
And we also then subsequently came back and collected data on uh, the census, uh, which, which uh, date back to right after the war, 1946. And it turns out that they are fairly well correlated, but we see as the baseline use the 51 uh, data because that's uh, when mortality among ethnic departees already went down substantially. So there were very high mortality rate during the, the um, journey, let's say, to the destination locations, and in the first uh, few years during the war. And uh, then, then it came down. So basically 1950 data, I better measure of the ex actual exposure, long-term exposure of the of uh, local uh, uh, population and the departee groups. Um, and of course, we combine these two, two uh, uh, sources and also add a lot of historical and geographical variables, which uh, I already showed you some balance on, but we can use them uh, as uh, uh, controls as well. And I'm going to show you that uh, as well. And here uh, in this map, again, let's uh, zoom into the area with most of the ethnic departations. And here I can show you the variation in the data, which we're using. The uh, pink lines are the boundaries of the regions, which, which are oblasts uh, or in, of the Soviet republics. And we see already from this map that there are many more Protestant departees uh, sort of in, in Russia than, than, than in Central Asia. At the same time, uh, we see that there is a lot of variation within regions in the, uh, between different municipalities in the group composition of the ethnic departees. And that's exactly the variation which we are going to uh, explore. So basically, we are going to compare within each of these oblasts wh whether the gender norms today of uh, the respondents differs depending on uh, the group composition of the departees, whether they're mostly Protestant or mostly uh, Muslim. Katya, just a quick question before we move on. Absolutely. You had originally described the way in which the the, refugee, the the refugees, the deportees got distributed was being drawn by the needs of labor. Was that a one-shot distribution? So like if you got sent to this town, you stayed in that town for 40 years, or was there reallocations of deportees around needs for labor? Because one would imagine the needs of labor would change in the post-war period as compared to the, uh, you know, during the war as compared to, you know, farther down the line. So that's an excellent question. And the answer is yes, there were relocations, but there weren't uh, that many of them, let's say. So there's uh, clearly uh, a lot of cost in moving people around. So, so that was uh, the, the, this mass movement, which happened during the war, could only happen once. After that, there was, of course, some migration uh, between different uh, localities with, uh, and, and sometimes even between different regions. But what we uh, see, and unfortunately, I don't think I have a slide here on this, but it would have been nice to, to, to show you. But let me describe it, or maybe, let me see if maybe I have that slide. Sorry, I really hate when people uh, move slides very fast during the departations, but I found it. So, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's good. So, uh, during the, this uh, presentation. So what we, what we do is the following. We do the following exercise. First, we compare the snapshot uh, of uh, uh, which we use uh, of the uh, uh, which groups were located to which uh, destination of departation to the census of uh, 1970 of the Soviet Union. And uh, that's what you see here. For example, at the regional level, we don't we don't have that we haven't done that exercise at the local level, but at the regional level, we see that it fits perfectly. So these are all uh, groups uh, of ethnic departees by region uh, in the Soviet Union in those places which where uh, which are not uh, the original um, you know homeland of these groups. And we see that it fits uh, essentially perfectly, this line. 
subject to one uh, point that these line, uh, the, the, this uh, scatter plot does not include Chechens because Chechens were already partnered by 1970. And on the other uh, uh, scatter plot, what we see here is uh, the difference between uh, the um, Well, actually, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't, uh, yeah. So, so this, so this is this. These are Muslim groups, and this, uh, these, these are Germans. So we see that there is uh, there is some more 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 noise in this. But generally, that's uh, so. If you if we are concerned about uh, 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 whether uh, uh, there is some kind of measurement error, usually that you know, if we think that the measurement error is classical, then it would bias against uh, find bias the our results against finding the the effect. We also compare the two snapshots, uh, one in, from forty six, the other is from fifty one, and again we see that there is some differences, but these could be differential mortality, differential uh, fertility, and also some movements. Thanks. I mean, I guess a priori, I would be more concerned about movement within regions than across regions. Like that's where you might expect the reallocation of labor to take place. And so even if you don't have systematic data, if you have some snapshots of that, it might be it might be useful for bolstering the argument. Although if, if the bias is again finding results, then maybe it's less it's less of a concern. But um, I just think I, I, given how much emphasis there is on, on getting and nailing down that this was quasi random, and that you have these particular moments of measuring in time, the more you can convince us that those are fixed measurements, the better. That's a, that's a good point. Well, we'll throw, we, in principle, we have uh, uh, all it takes to get the data to show you the same uh, scatter plots at the, at the locality level. We haven't done it yet. And uh, this comes back to the earlier Tim's question about the variation in the actual data for which we have uh, uh, our outcomes. So, so here we only look at those destinations of ethnic deportations, which are also happen to be uh, the places for which we have uh, our outcome variable, because these are the primary sampling units of the life and transition survey. And we see here the shares of Protestant and Muslim deportees across these uh, um, different PSUs. And you see that there's a lot of variation. So let me just skip the uh, equations here and just tell you that essentially our empirical, the first empirical exercise is very simple. We are comparing within uh, the uh, subnational regions, uh, those uh, uh, places which uh, happen to be, uh, you know, also we're comparing only among places which were destinations of ethnic deportation. We compare the gender norms for places which uh, happen to have mostly Protestant versus mostly uh, uh, Muslim deportation, where we use uh, the, uh, the religion of the ethnic deportees as a proxy for their gender norms, essentially. So now let me say a couple of words about uh, uh, what kind of uh, outcome variables we use. So, uh, in this life and transition survey, there were three questions which were asked uh, uh, re about the gender norms. Particularly, the respondents were supposed to ask uh, to answer on a four-point Likert scale whether they agree or disagree with the following statements: a woman should always do most of the household chores, even if the husband is unemployed and staying at home. It is better if men earns the money in the family uh, always, and uh, men make better political leaders than women do. And uh, we use these answers to these questions one by one, but also aggregate them in a single uh, measure, which is the first principal component normalized from zero to one. And you will basically that uh, gives you the main results. So the same, exactly the same story is for each of these components. Let me uh, tell you what it is. So. Here, uh, there are two sets of uh, regressions. So one looks at the size of the ethnic departations, Protestant departation and, and Muslim departation separately. 
And the second uh, panel, the panel B, shows the, uh, uh, the effect of the share of Protestants among all ethnic departees. And irrespective of how you uh, look at the data, what we see is that today in the locations which used to be the sites of uh, uh, Protestant or you can say German deportation, uh, the respondents today have significantly more egalitarian uh, attitudes towards uh, gender. Uh, here, we separately look at females and males, but it turns out that there is very little difference between, uh, between the results for the two. And interestingly, so if we look at the exposure to Muslim deportations, it is negative, but it is much smaller in, in magnitudes and pretty precisely in and, and, and insignificant, despite the fact that standard errors are pretty large. So we can uh, reject the uh, equality of these in absolute values, and we can, of course, reject the equality of it generally without taking the absolute values. And if we look at the results on the, with the share of Protestant departees, that's a little bit easier to interpret. So essentially, there's a direct interpretation of this, so, which is that if, uh, local population were exposed to 100% German deportation, and it's likely to be today to have 15 percentage points uh, uh, more uh, egalitarian gender, gender attitudes as measured by this uh, uh, composite zero to one, to one measure. And uh, this is true for men and women, as I men mentioned. So, uh, so the question is whether these attitudes are uh, uh, transferred in, in any kind of behavior. And uh, for that, we'll look in particular at uh, two, two, two variables, which is the main variable which we we'll look at, as I already mentioned in the beginning, which is the answer to the question on whether the respondent pride themselves as, as, uh, at entrepreneurship. So it's attempted entrepreneurship because that's the only variable which, is exist, which exists in, in LITS. And here, interestingly, there is a sharp contrast between uh, the effects for the uh, female respondents and for the male respondents. And uh, we think that it's a very, very important uh, piece of evidence because this is essentially the first piece of evidence which I can show you, which uh, uh, convinces us that it's not the differences in the environment uh, or selection which are driving our results. In particular, if it were the case that it so happened that Protestants ended up in locations which are more uh, 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 substantial, uh, which are more conducive to entrepreneurship, we would have seen the exactly the same results for men and women. Moreover, we also could say that even if the uh, the uh, channel for our results is different from uh, from just transmission of gender norms. For example, you know, as I mentioned, uh, Germans were different from anybody else in all sorts of different characteristics. For example, the level of education. So, if if the mechanism was through the effect of being exposed to more educated group we would again see the same results for, for men and women. What we see in contrast is that uh, women who uh, live in localities which were exposed to Protestant departees are more likely to try themselves in, at entrepreneurship. And those who, were were, who live in the localities which were exposed uh, to Muslim deportation were less likely, significantly less likely to, be, uh, to, uh, to try themselves to, uh, at entrepreneurship. And that's not the case for, the, uh, for men. Gotcha. Uh, oh, yes. Can I ask a quick question? Um, are there, how much intermarriage was there between deportees and locals? And did it vary by the sort of uh, where deportees came from? And is that another mechanism of transmission? So that's an excellent question. And uh, we definitely can rule out that as a uh, only mechanism for the following reasons. So uh, the Soviet anthropologists are saying that there was essentially no intermarriages in Central Asia 
uh, uh, between the local population and the parties, and this is mostly because of the racial differences. So the, the Central Asian uh, Asians uh, had different race than any of the of the parties. At the same time, uh, we we cannot say that this mechanism was fully absent because there was actually you know two groups which uh, were quite likely to, uh, between which we, we, we are quite likely to see intermarriages, which are uh, Soviet Germans and Russians, particularly in, uh, in Siberia. So the important thing why we are not seeing them in these results is because actually, uh, uh, essentially uh, there are, we are almost sure that uh, there are no um, uh, descendants of uh, German departees in our sample because all German departees and all their relatives, including those whom they married at the departation destinations, were given German passports uh, at the time of the fall of the uh, of the of the Soviet Union. So essentially, everybody immigrated. So there are there are very few if if at all, uh, descendants of the German departees in the areas. In and fact, I, I actually interviewed uh, one of these uh, German departees who, who lives in, in, in uh, Brussels now, but he, he, he uh, was given German passport and uh, 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 that's how he ended up in Europe. Yes, please. Can I can I so do do we know the ethnicities of people who are answering the question right in 2016, and does it does it matter if uh, do the do these results vary by ethnicity, and also could it be the case that more Russians moved in into areas previously where previously many Germans lived during the Soviet times? So these are all uh, great questions and. Uh, 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 we, we do know the uh, ethnicities and we, uh, um, how shall I say, it? is this possible if I postpone it a little bit? Because there are two, uh, two exercises which we do, which uh, will directly speak to, to these two questions. And I think it would be nice to try to postpone them just for, for, for five minutes or so, okay? And I'll, I promise I come back to this. Uh, uh, right, so let me just be very, very brief about uh, the identification. The main identification assumption is the one which we discussed with uh, and which Josh asked about. So, but given that we assume that there is a random exposure, it is, uh, it is important to show that indeed none of the observables actually change anything in these results. And that's indeed the case. So even if we stick in some of the observables which are potentially endogenous, for example, the you know, parent education, which I'm gonna come to in a second, or just not have any controls apart from just the, the ones which are important for identification, which are region fixed effects and the presence of the departation. You get exactly the same result. The same is for the female entrepreneurship. We also have a couple of exercises to try to understand uh, whether uh, it is likely that our results are driven by the uh, omitted variables, let's say. Uh, and we use the techniques which were de uh, developed by economists, the Altonji Elder and Taber, and also Emily Oster, and the punchline of it, that it's, ve it's very unlikely. It looks like we have so many covariates and they basically barely move our estimates if we include them or not. This, this means that it's very unlikely that we missed something very important, which would drive our results. However, all of these results are still cross-sectional, which, uh, doesn't mean that, that we can nail identification. So it would be nice to uh, see something, some outcome which we could observe both before and after the, the, the departations. And we actually have something which resembles such an outcome, which is we look at the ultimate educational attainment of mothers of our respondents. And we know the cohorts of mothers of the respondents and we group them into uh, several groups. Those mothers who did their compulsory schooling before the departees arrived, 
those mothers who did their schooling, compulsory schooling, and compulsory schooling then was five years uh, during the uh, war, which actually meant that the education probably was heavily dis disrupted. And those mothers who did their education after the departees arrived, so in other words, they were likely to go to school together with the, with the children of the departees. And what we see here is the effect estimated um, separately for these different cohorts. So essentially, this is a way for us to show that there is no pretrends. So we see that there is an effect on mothers' ultimate education depending on whether they were at school with uh, uh, depart German departees or let's say Chechen departees. However, that effect only comes in after the war. In other words, when there was a real exposure and there is absolutely nothing before on top of that. But here actually, let me say that this is essentially the same exercise as, as I've done with the uh, with the attitudes and the female entrepreneurship, because we, here we can compare different localities of the same region, but for different cohorts of mothers. So, uh, so this is the second piece of evidence which uh, convinces us that there is no something, there is nothing special about the locations where Germans ended up compared to the locations where Muslims and Muslims ended up within uh, the uh, within the. Uh, the regions within the oblast. However, we can even make that, uh, make that exercise even more stringent because we can put in the locality fixed effects and only look at how uh, the education, the ultimate education of mothers of our respondents uh, differs by cohorts separately for those localities which were exposed to Muslim deportations compared to those localities which were exposed to uh, Protestant deportees. And this is essentially difference in differences exercise where uh, we, uh, the, this graph shows you the results of that. So what we see it, again compared to the cohort of mothers which was educated during the war, there is an effect for subsequent cohorts, they are substantially more educated compared to this cohort. For those places which were exposed to uh, German departees, and it's not the case for for the for the cohort which was uh, of mothers which was educated before. And uh, just the the final point on this is that. Uh, it is still important to note that mother's education is not the only mechanism which drives all the results because if we look at the attitudes of respondents, they respond to the, uh, or they're correlated, let's say, with the ethnic structure of the departees, irrespective of the, which cohort of mothers they were born to. So even for the mothers who got their education before the departees arrived, you know, the, 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 their kids were, who were subsequently exposed to the, uh, to the departees uh, got different attitudes. Pacha? And, uh, yeah, yeah. We have a question from Natalia Lambarova. Natalia, do you want to ask? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I really wanted to ask, um, did you try to look at some non-parametric approach uh, to figure out uh, what is the, um, critical mass of people that's necessary to generate all those effects. That would be really fascinating. Yeah, so, so that, that comes to, the, to, to, to the, also the earlier question about the, uh, the differences between uh, uh, the size of the local population and the parties. Let me jump to this. And I remember about the questions on the, on the mi migration of uh, locals, and I'm coming to that uh, as well, and on the, on the uh, ethnicity. So for this question in particular, indeed, there was quite a large variation in uh, the size of the deportation compared to local population. And what we do is we look at the effect of the uh, 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 share of Protestants among all ethnic departees, depending on the relative uh, size of ethnic deportation to pre-war population. It's important to note that the first post-war census was in 59, which is uh, quite a bit later. So we, the, the, the best uh, 
the best proxy for the uh, uh, relative share of departees in the local population is the, the pre-war census. It's important, however, to, to, to note that Soviet Union lost about 15% of its population. So it's a noisy uh, measure. However, what we see here is that uh, 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 sort of by four quartiles, uh, the, this, uh, uh, this, this ratio, or maybe I should look, uh, show, show you the distribution of this. So there were some localities where the number of uh, departees was really overwhelming. But uh, for most places, uh, it was uh, uh, large, but not that large. And the first three uh, groups in this four quartiles are up to, uh, th that ratio is up to uh, 13 percentage points. In other words, one out of 10 people in the locality would be a, 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 an ethnic departee, uh, provided that there was no change in the, in the local population, which is of course a very strong assumption. However, there were some localities in which uh, there were five times as many departees as local population here. And what we see is that the effect on gender attitudes actually is present. It increases first with the relative number of uh, the departees and then decreases when it becomes too big, which may uh, suggest that, that for the gender attitudes in particular, for the horizontal transmission of them, it is... Uh, uh, more likely that it's driven by uh, the number of actual communications between the, between the groups. And when the uh, number of ethnic departees was too big, there was less of such communication. Why would, would we expect them to be more segregated? It's because, well, first of all, they had to build their own barracks. Second, they probably had enough of uh, manpower to organize and into work units. And given that these are probably very special locations which needed a lot of manual labor, they could probably uh, not uh, in, uh, interact with the local population too much. Interestingly so, however, we don't see the same pattern for the female entrepreneurship. And here, we don't know what the, what we, what the difference between them is, what the explanation to this is, uh, to this fact is. However, I have a guess. So this is a pure speculation, if you like. And this spe pure speculation comes from the fact that the effect on the uh, female entrepreneurship comes mostly from the negative effect of the exposure to Muslim departees. Whereas the gender attitudes are mostly positive effect of the exposure to Protestant departees. So it seems that the, for the negative effect, you don't really need to have cooperation and contact as much as for the, uh, for the positive effect. So now let me uh, briefly uh, talk about how we handle the differences across different ethnic groups. So, uh, so what we did, we calculated the cultural distances, by, by, to be precise, the religious distances and the linguistic distances among each pairs of these, of these groups. And for the religious distances, it's essentially uh, trivial because uh, uh, Central Asians are Muslims, Chechens, Crimean Tatars and Miskatian Turns are Muslims, so the religious distance is zero. And the uh, German uh, uh, departees and Russians uh, are, have not, not the same religion, but the distance between the two is smaller than, be, than between uh, Christians and, and, and Muslims. So at the same time, as far as linguistic distances are concerned, these are, uh, there's quite a lot of variation in them. And uh, what we do with this, uh, we, we look at whether the cultural distance leads to uh, bigger cultural transmission or small cultural transmission. So this is one way to, to, to answer the question on whether there is any heterogeneous effect by, by ethnic groups. And I'm sorry that I, I'm aware that this is a very big table, but let me just summarize for you what we see. We see only few uh, significant interaction effects between the, uh, the um, uh, cu cultural distance and the uh, exposure to a certain kind of departees. However, 
every time we see some significant effects, they point into the direction that there is more uh, horizontal cultural transmissions for groups which are regionally more distant. Uh, and uh, uh, this partly may be essentially a mechanical effect that there is more to learn from a group which is farther away from you, but this is as much as we get. So in other words, we have a stronger effect of the exposure to Protestant departees for Central Asia than, than, than for Russia. And that's, that's the, the kind of heterogeneity we have explored. And now let me come to the, finally to the question of possible uh, migration of locals. So we are looking at the exposure to uh, ethnic departees which were assigned to their location so they couldn't move. However, the local population was free so they could move. So the question is, could it be that our results, for example, are driven by uh, selective in-migration of locals to places which, uh, uh, for example, were where the German departees lived and the selective out-migration from the places where, where Muslim departees live, for example. So there are two, uh, uh, two exercises which we do to address this question. So first of all, uh, the life and transition survey has a question where the uh, uh, name the location where your ancestors from the family of your mother's side and from you from of your father's side lived before the uh, second world war in 1939 and we use that uh, uh, data and the first three uh, columns here essentially replicate our main result on a subsample of respondents who live in the same places where their, uh, where, where their ancestors lived before the war. So this essentially rules out the uh, possibility that this is a selective in-migration which drives our results, right? So we look at those who didn't move and uh, they were at some point exposed to the uh, ethnic departees, and we see the result for them, both for gender attitudes and for the for the female uh, for the female entrepreneurship, exactly the same as in the full sample. So that's part of the story. However, there is another part of the story, which is that okay, we know that there is a fact for the for the stairs. However, it could very well be the case that we still do not have causal estimation if we think about the differential out-migration. Suppose, for example, that those people who didn't like uh, departees or whose uh, gender roles were very, or gender norms were very different from those of the parties out-migrated. And only those whose gender norms and gender culture was close to departees didn't out-migrate. So then we would get exactly the same results as I presented you, but again, that wasn't, wouldn't be an evidence of horizontal cultural transmission. So in order to rule that out, we do two uh, exercises. First, we actually use exactly the same question about uh, where your, uh, your ancestors lived before the war. And in column four, we uh, first check whether uh, it, whether it is uh, the case that the probability that the person moved out uh, is uh, uh, related to the group composition of uh, the ethnic departees in the locality. So that exercise, for that exercise, we basically, uh, so far, I presented, maybe I should be a little bit slower to, to, be, to be quick, uh, to, to, to be clear here. So far, I presented you all the analysis for the respondents. So now let's uh, suppose that our unit of analysis is an ancestor who lived in a place in, nine, in certain place in 1939 in the Soviet Union. So we, we take all the ancestors who lived in those uh, places which subsequently became destinations of ethnic deportations and in column four, we check whether it's more likely that they move out if the if the deportation place became the, the place of Protestant departee, uh, deportation or Muslim deportation, and we find no results. However, 
that's already something that's that is a first step to understand that there is no uh, out migration driving out results. However, the fact that the numbers are not of out migrants are not related to the composition of ethnic deportation doesn't necessarily mean that there is no selective uh, out migration. Maybe it is the, the numbers of people who have migrated are similar, but the type of them and their gender norms is different. So in order to check that, we do the exercise which I present to you in column five. Here, we basically look at those people uh, whose ancestors lived in the uh, locations which became the uh, destinations of ethnic departations. And we measure their gender attitudes today uh, depending on whether they moved out or not, interacted with whether these ancestors lived in a place which was exposed to Protestant departations or Muslim departations. And this is essentially for us a direct test of uh, uh, no selective out migration. So these two exercises together basically con uh, convince us that uh, uh, selective in and out migration is not what's uh, driving our results. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions about this and whether I answered at least partially the questions which were asked uh, before. All right, so let me uh, move uh, uh, forward then. And um, uh, so one, one important point, at least for economists, always to try to understand, uh, you know, what is the actual correct unit of analysis? And we uh, uh, sort of uh, operationalize it with uh, 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 trying to understand at what level uh, our uh, stand, uh, error terms are correlated and we do different uh, exercises and basically the punchline of this exercise is that uh, it's, it's pretty robust. So I know that we are coming to the, to the end of, the, uh, of our discussion. So let me uh, uh, conclude and after that, you know, we'll have a few, few minutes for the, for the discussion still. Uh, so we, we would, I would, let me uh, basically say that the evidence which I showed you it, to us is the evidence of the diffusion of gender norms uh, from the parties to the local population. And we think that it's important because there is no real control over what these people did at the destination locations. Uh, it's important to note that both norms of gender equality and of gender discrimination uh, uh, that horizontally uh, were transmitted, but we certainly can, can see that the diffusion of norms of gender equality was much stronger. And the question then is why would that be the case? And here we cannot uh, uh, give you an evidence of one mechanism or the other, but we can at least uh, try to think about what, what drives this uh, 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 differences between the transmission of positive and negative, uh, let's say, gender norms. And here it's important to uh, think uh, from, what we, from our standpoint about the costs and benefits of uh, accepting a different culture. And of course, there are both political and economic costs and benefits. And we think that the most probable reason why the uh, German norms diffused more is because they were in line with the official ideology. So uh, by accepting these uh, norms, when you see sort of the role models in front of you, they were the local population were not violating any rules imposed by the Soviet state. But could all, it could also be the case that some of this had to do, has to do with economic benefits because actually uh, more progressive uh, gender norms are also are more economically viable when your uh, daughter and wife go to, goes to school that potentially leads to much higher incomes because even in the very compressed wage distribution in the Soviet Union, there were there were returns to higher education, for example. And finally, it could also be the case that Soviet Germans were just more cooperative, essentially, and more integrated uh, than, than 
let's say, for example, Chechens, and there's a lot of uh, anthropological evidence that Chechens, after being deported, were, were really um, not cooperating with the state very much. So that could also have something to do with this difference, but probably the most simple explanation that uh, it's it, it, the fact that being in line with official ideology is what's driving it would be uh, probably the right answer. Let me stop here. Great. Thank you so much. I think we have, I have one question from Anton S. Um, and we'll see if we have time for any more. You can feel free to raise your hand. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Yekaterina Vselovodovna. The, uh, for uh, the great presentation. So I was reading uh, right now the Wikipedia page on Russian Germ on uh, Russian Ger on Germans in Russia, and according to this 2010 uh, Russian census, it's around one million uh, German uh, one million uh, citizens of German descent. So these are probably people who, in the survey, can answer that they are Russians, but they actually have some German. Uh, uh, ancestors. And uh, according to the map that they I, I actually, uh, from Wikipedia, I will, I, I, I will send it to chat. Uh, most of them are actually uh, populated in exactly these Siberian in, in regions this that you were talking uh, about. So I think at this point, you cannot fully disentangle between the horizontal no norms and the uh, vertical norms where these norms were just inherited by the uh, by the descendants, so I think one of the uh, one to, to to make to make to make sure to to make some robustness checks for for this uh, for this exercise, you could just replicate all of these results without considering uh, Siberian regions and only looking at the Asian regions. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, this is excellent comment, and we we do exactly that. So, so first of all, we we have. Uh, only uh, results for the Central Asia, where the uh, we only consider the title ethnicities which are Asians. So we have all the results only for that, and that's part of the reason why we can claim that the evidence is on horizontal uh, cultural transmission. So we are absolutely certain that uh, we, uh, you know those uh, descendants of the uh, departees. Who you know the few who, who are left in the deportation locations are driving any of our results. So that is that is absolutely certain, basically. So that's much easier to show than, for example, the the uh, quasi random exposure. So that's that's uh, a part which is which is uh, hard to argue. Let's say. So that's. But thank you for the question. You are, you're right to. Ask it. It's a good question. It's two o'clock here. So thank you so much, Katya, for a great talk. We enjoyed it. And thanks to everybody for joining us this week, particularly uh, people from Jordan Center.